been a crazy week last week, as I'm sure you guys know, but it looks like we are good to go to remain in person, which is good because online teaching, it's, it's not the best, at, le at least for me as an instructor. Again, the best way I can see if you guys are actually understanding the material, look at you guys. On Zoom, I can't really do that. So, yeah. Uh, that's from my perspective as an instructor, but what about you guys? Is there anybody that prefers the online learning? All right, so we have a couple. How many of you guys think it's best as kind of a, a mixture? Yeah? I'd say that's the one thing that was nice about online learning is last year it forced a lot of the professors to record their lectures. So it's available to you guys after, which I think is great. I know when I was an undergrad, your only concern just isn't classes. You guys may have family things, you guys may have personal things, you guys just might be a little bit tired that day and you can't go to class. So it's good that there's resources available to you guys. That's that's my opinion. Uh, is my opinion shared by professors in the faculty? Well, some of them, no. <laughs> there was a lot that were actually against recording you guys because they said, well, if I record them and provide them materials, they're not going to come to my class. <laughs> I said, well, who cares? It's about uh, if you guys are doing well. And if you guys are doing well, that should be all that all that matters. Uh, it's funny because one of them said, I have a great idea to get them to come to class. I'll do mandatory quizzes. I said, oh, they'll love you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, don't, I didn't think that went over too well. So before we get in, we got a couple announcements. Let's see if I can remember them all. Uh, the first one is on the kind of the main part of e-class. At the very top, I listed some APEGA events. Uh, there is a student liaison. He gave me kind of a list of events. I posted them. You guys should check them out because it helps. I was one of the undergraduate students that wouldn't get involved in anything. I wasn't a part of any clubs, any volunteering, nothing. Because I thought, well, who cares? Go to employers. They're going to want to make sure you know your stuff, and that's it. Well, being in the position I am now, I actually got to talk to employers. I mean, talking to them about you guys, you Alberta students, they said, when it comes to technical skills, you guys are all good. Where you Alberta is actually lacking is your soft skills. You guys know what soft skills are? Your ability to communicate. So if you guys want to prepare for the job market, which you guys are third and fourth years, you guys probably already started, work on those soft skills. That's what employers really want to see. All right, so... And PEG is really good with that. They have a bunch of events. I don't recommend, or I'm not going to say I don't recommend. I wouldn't go specifically for the events. I'd go to just start talking to people. Not even to try and network, but just talk to people. Get used to talking to people you don't know, stuff like that, because it'll help you a lot when it comes to your guys' interviews and stuff like that. All right? Unless you guys want to become an academic, then you guys can just stay introverted. But uh, I'm not sure if you guys want to go down that route. So, Yeah. Uh, that was the first announcement. Uh, second announcement, we have a final exam date. So we uh, kind of sorted it out with the, uh, it's called the exam planning committee. <laughs> but yeah, so our final exam, I believe, I posted on eClass, it is December 16th, two o'clock, two to five o'clock. Now, I actually didn't really know this too much before, but what they're trying to do now is that the final exam date is always based on your lecture time. So since we are Tuesday, Thursday, 8 a.m., that means that we have to write on December 16th from 2 to 5. Now, I'm not sure about you guys, but I always hated afternoon exams. You wake up at 9 or 10, and then you just sit and worry all day long until the exam. I prefer just to get it over with, and then you guys can deal with the exam afterwards, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, uh, that's the final exam, 25, or 50 multiple choice questions. Then it leads me to exams in general, because I think the one portion of multiple choice that students don't like is it's right or wrong. There's no partial marks. So I'll give you guys the option. As you guys know in your assignment, we use something called STAT. It's numerical questions. You guys have all different numbers. But what's nice about it is I'm able to incorporate partial marks. So when it comes to exams, would you guys prefer some numerical questions for the chance to get partial marks, or do you want it just strictly multiple choice? Who wants strictly multiple choice? All right, couple. Who wants the addition of numerical questions with partial marks? Oh, so there's kind of a majority. 
So I'll send an email out just to really make sure that there's no people saying, Clayton, I'm going to hate you if you do this. Please don't do that. But uh, yeah, I can start adding some numerical ones in. Speaking of the first midterm, after we cover today's lecture material, which we technically already covered, that's it for midterm one. So at the end of this lecture today, this is everything that will be tested on the first midterm. Make sense to you guys? Shouldn't be too bad. Again, the midterm will be uh, during class time, but it will be online. It'll be online through eClass. Now, if you guys have questions during the midterm, because you guys are in person, you guys can come here and write to the midterm, okay? You guys can bring your laptops, you guys can do it here, and I will be here during that class time to answer questions if you guys have them. Now, do you guys want to wake up early just to come see me? Probably not. <laughs> I don't want to wake up early to see me, so why would you guys? So that's going to kind of what's going to happen. For the final exam, I'm not too sure. Now it comes to the, the good news and the bad news sort of scenario. It's actually more bad than good. <laughs> this is kind of what happened last time. Uh, we were ahead. At the end of, uh, I guess, last week on Tuesday, our last in-person lecture, we were ahead. And today we were supposed to start straight, which was great because your assignment this week, assignment three, it's technically some of this and some of strain, but it's like 90% strain. So for those of you guys in the lab section today, I'm going to apologize because most of the assignments, you guys have no clue what's going on, but I'll try my best to explain. And another reason why it's bad is because we were ahead during the, I believe our exam is on Thursday. So the Tuesday lecture, we were going to use it to just go over a sample midterm together. You can't do that now because we're technically now behind because we lost the lecture. However, if you guys want, we can do it Tuesday night from five till whenever. Would you guys like that? Yeah? Okay, perfect. So there are three sample midterms posted. I want you guys to go through them, and I want you guys to tell me which one you guys would like us to solve together. Again, I will host probably a Zoom meeting from 5 o'clock at night till whenever, and we'll go over one of the sample midterms completely together. All right? I want you guys to feel prepared. The exams in this class are pretty easy. They're not too crazy, so hopefully you guys will be doing well. I don't want to stress you guys out. I, uh, I snuck my way into Yong's E class. <laughs> you guys are probably already stressed out. I watched one of his lectures. Ooh, he's he, he's just too smart for us. I, I think that's the best way to describe it. He's just too smart for us. Makes everything so, sound so simple. And then at the end of every sentence, he goes, understand? It's like, <laughs> no. And then he just laughs and moves on. All right. So today is a very special day because we're finishing up our preliminaries. Again, we said before we get into the actual juicy part of the course, stress, strain, whatever, we need to do some mathematical preliminary background. Now, we were supposed to do this last week, and we did go over it last week, but I said that today is going to be the, the actual lecture because no one was in the right mindset last week. So I don't blame you guys. So today we're going to finish off talking about second-order tensors or matrices. We're going to discuss the inverse invariants, and just some special types of tensors. Now, these special types of tensors are going to be very important. I wouldn't talk about them if they weren't. As we're going to see, our stress tensor, our strain tensor, and all the other tensors we deal with, they're all going to be what we call symmetric tensors. And it's going to lead to a lot of very nice calculations. It's one of those rare times that it actually simplifies our work instead of making it, making it a little bit more complicated. So when we're talking about the inverse, we said, all right, the inverse isn't too bad. The purpose of the inverse is if I have a linear map that takes my inputs and goes to my outputs, well, I can take the inverse of that linear map and go from my output back to my input. The best example of this would be the kind of the typical structural equation where the stiffness times displacement is equal to force. If I want to find displacement, I have to take that stiffness and invert it over to the other side. So that's the most common example. And this is why structural analysis software takes so long to compute. That whole computation time, even though it sounds like it's doing crazy things in the background, all it's actually doing is taking a stiffness matrix and inverting it. That's why computation takes so long. Now, you guys are kind of designers. Typically, we have forces, and we want to solve for displacements. Can you guys think of a scenario where it's the opposite way, where we know the displacements 
and we want to figure out the forces. Is there an actual design scenario that actually has this? What do you guys think? When we design structures, we typically go to the National Building Code and they got loads for everything. I can go to the building code and I'll say lecture hall with 200 seat capacity, here's your loads. But I should say this, it's always almost all loads. But there are some scenarios where we actually know displacements and want to find forces. The most common one being earthquakes. Earthquakes don't impose forces on your structure. It takes the base of it and starts shaking it, displacing it. And dynamically, the building's going to start moving. So the forces on the structure are actually proportional to the mass of the structure. That's why you guys see in earthquake zones, when we have those typical wooden houses, two stories, they don't ever fall down because they're light. The only time you're ever worried about an earthquake is when your structure is heavy. That's why when you go up, 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 they need a lot of bracing. And that's why they typically like use things like steel because it doesn't weigh as much. Timber structures are actually fine for earthquakes. Perfectly fine from a strength perspective. But if you're on the 20th floor in an earthquake, it's you're actually going to be flying back and forth. Yeah, it's safe from a strength perspective, but when you throw up all over the floor, you're not going to be too happy. So that's why we don't use timber for very high rise buildings. So I'm getting off topic. We're going back to the inverse. So if the tensor M or matrix is invertible, then the inverse has the following property where we can take our original tensor, multiply it by its inverse, and we get the identity matrix. So this is just going to be one, 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 and the rest are equal to zero. If we want to calculate it for a 2D scenario, it's actually not too bad at all. We take one and divide it by the determinant of M. So the determinant is just going to be a number that we figure out. So this right here is going to be a scalar. And then we multiply each component of this newer matrix by the scalar. If we look at this newer matrix, it's almost identical to this one, but two exceptions. The first one is I take A1 and B2, so they're originally right here, and I swap. And then the second thing is that I take A2 and B1, I keep them in the same spots, but then I just throw a negative sign. Nice and simple. 3D scenario, well, it gets a little bit more complex. We go 1 divided by the determinant of M, so same as 2D. But now in order to find the columns, we have to take the rows and use the cross product. So if we were to do this by hand, we have to do the cross product three times. No one wants to do the cross product three times. That's why I said in our assignments, we're just going to throw in some mathematics. So again, the columns are obtained from the cross product. Nice and simple. Invariance. Now this is where it's going to get fun in the exam. I started creating the midterm and I thought, okay, well, look, how can I be sneaky? Invariance. Invariants are used to relate two matrices together. If one matrix is the same as another matrix, just to change a basis, then they share something called invariants. So invariants are with tensor M are values that remain constant. So here's the key, remain constant after a change of basis occurs. And there's going to be three invariants that we look at. So here's the key here. If I have two different tensors, M and M prime, where M prime is just a coordinate transformation of M, they are going to share these values. Now what's going to happen in the exam, I can guarantee you, is I'll give you two matrices, and I'll give you this definition where I'll say, all right, we've got A and B, but B is just a coordinate transformation of A, and I'll ask you some properties. I'm not going to tell you the word invariance, but if I give you this definition, you should know that these two matrices are going to share some properties. That's how I get you guys in exams. The first invariant is simply the trace of a matrix. It looks complicated. Whenever you see a summation, everybody cringes, but it's actually not too bad. So we got invariant one, or simply TR of M, which is the trace, and it's just going to be the sum of the diagonal components. Nice and easy. So if I were to have a matrix, which didn't transfer over to Apple very well, all we're going to do is just take the diagonal components and sum them together. That's it. The second invariance, this again gets a little bit more complex. It's not something we will use in this course, is this fancy definition here, where the second invariance is one half of the trace of m squared. So the trace of m is from above, minus the trace of mf. So before we calculate the second invariance, we have to find this mf. A lot of students will just go to the trace of M, 
get marks taken off the exam. So don't forget that it's MM, kind of the only secret. And then the last one, the third invariant is simply the determinant, which we talked about a lot. So what you guys will see on an exam is I'll say, all right, the determinant of M is let's say 16. And then I look at and I'll say, what is the determinant of M prime? And I'm not going to give you guys M prime. A lot of students start freaking out. Well, if I don't know M prime, how can I find the determinant? Well, it's going to be the same as M. So this is how I can use them in exams, try and make the questions a little bit tricky. So those are the inverse, as well as the invariants. The next thing we're going to talk about are orthogonal tensors. These ones are very crazy, and these are the ones that caused you guys a lot of headache on assignment two because it had a lot of weird numbers, and you guys were saying, oh, well, is that an exponent? Is this multiplied? So let's talk about them. A tensor Q is deemed orthogonal if Q transpose of Q is equal to the identity matrix. Where are we going to encounter these in the course? Well, Q, we typically use or associate with the change of basis. So every time we want to rotate something, if we use a change of basis, that tensor that causes rotation is actually orthogonal. And it's going to be the same thing with reflections. So rotations, if I take my coordinate system and rotate it, I can also reflect it. So if this is the Y axis and this is the X, I can also reflect it so I can swap the X over to the other side. It could be on the exam. So because of this property, it actually allows us to define a lot of other properties, sub-properties, if you will. First one is the determinant of Q is equal to plus or minus one, right? Plus or minus one. This will be an example, sure. And what this does is this also indicates that the tensor is invertible. But for our purposes, this is going to be important because as we just talked about rotation or reflection, the value of one, whether it's positive or negative, will help us indicate rotation or reflection. So if our determinant is positive one, Q is associated with rotation. If our determinant is equal to negative one, Q is associated with reflection. If you guys go through the sample midterms, 2014, 2015, 2016, every single one has a question, is Q rotation or reflection? Well, now you guys know exactly what you need to do to determine that, all right? So that's gonna be the first one. The second one is the rows of Q are orthogonal, meaning that if I were to take my matrix Q here and I were to look at the rows as vectors, so A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, etc., and dot them together, I'm going to get equal to zero. All right, that makes sense? Same with the columns. So if I were to look at the columns now instead of the rows and dot them together, I still get equal to zero. And then the last one is the product of two orthogonal tensors is also orthogonal. So that's going to be orthogonal tensors. Where are you going to see them? Again, coordinate transformation, rotation, or reflection. You guys think we're going to be rotating our strain tensors later on? Yes. How about our stress tensors? Yes. So that's why I have to tell you guys about orthogonal tensors, because they're going to appear for the rest of the course. Now we're going to talk about symmetric tensors. I've already kind of hinted that our stress and our strain tensors are going to be symmetric. Now, it's actually a good thing because it allows us to simplify things. So a tensor is symmetric if S is equal to S transpose. That's the key here, all right? And this allows us to get some nice properties. What does this mean? Well, it means that the diagonal components are going to be the same. So if we had a regular stress tensor S, one of the main things that we're going to be doing later on in the course is I'm going to say, give me all these values. What we're going to see is these diagonal values are going to be our axial stresses. So if I were to pull horizontally in this direction, this direction, and this direction, and these off diagonal components are actually the shear stresses. You guys have probably already seen this in 270. Now, if I were to say, give me the components, and there's nine of them, well, you guys will hate me. So what happens is, is this is actually symmetric, as we're going to see. We're going to prove that it is symmetric later on. What does this mean? Well, it means that S12 over here is the same on the other side. S12 is equal to S21. Same thing for S13 and S23. So it actually simplifies things, makes our calculations a lot easier. Now, symmetric tensors have some nice properties. And the first one is this. For any two vectors U and V and a symmetric tensor S, S multiplied by A dot B is equal to A dot S B. Kind of a little fun fact for exams. 
Uh, the second one is the coordinate transformation of S, S prime, is also symmetric. So this is another very fun one. And finally, an n by n symmetric tensor has n real eigenvalues associated with n orthonormal eigenvectors. So the one thing I want you to take away from number three right here is the eigenvalues will always be real. All right, that's kind of the key here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take properties two and three, and we're going to combine them together into something very important called diagonalization. We're going to be doing this with stress as well as strain. It's going to become very important to us. So symmetric tensor S is transformed by a coordinate transformation matrix Q consisting of the eigenvectors of S. The resulting tensor is diagonal. Again, a lot of words. It's not really fun. So let's see what exactly this means. We have a symmetric tensor S. So let's say that this is our stress tensor. And we want to transform it. In this case, we're going to rotate it. This is going to be a rotation matrix. But the special thing is, is the entries of Q, P, Q, and R, they're going to be our eigenvectors. All right, so here's the key. If we take our transformation matrix Q and throw in our eigenvectors, well, the resulting definition or the resulting tensor will look like this, always. So if we look here, this is special because these right here, they're the eigenvalues. This becomes very important in exams, and we're going to cover a, qu a question today that will show you guys why this is important. If I were to give you guys this right here, as well as this matrix, but I don't tell you guys that these are the eigenvectors, but if you guys were to get this matrix that's simply diagonal, and I were to say, what are the eigenvectors? Well, you guys don't have to calculate anything. You guys know that these right here are going to be the eigenvectors. That's kind of a very special thing that we do later on. So the diagonal components are the eigenvalues right here, and the off-diagonal components are zero. This is going to be important to us because, as you guys remember from CIVI 270, we have principal stresses. If this was my stress tensor and I were to do this operation, these values right here are going to be our principal stresses. All right, this is, goes back to more circling. So because of this, we can also kind of relate it to the concept of invariance. Invariant one of S should be the same as invariant one of S prime, because all we did was rotate it. So therefore, invariant one is simply the three eigenvalues added together. Invariant two is the eigenvalues kind of multiplied together, then added, and then invariant three is simply the three eigenvalues multiplied together. So I can say in an exam, the eigenvalues of a matrix are, let's say, one, two, and three. I won't give you the matrix. And I'll say, what is the determinant of that matrix? Again, students freak out. I don't have the matrix. How am I supposed to calculate eigenvalues? Well, if I know, or sorry, how am I supposed to calculate the determinant? Well, if I know the three eigenvalues, just multiply them together, that's going to be my determinant. All right? So you guys can see where this starts to get a lot of fun. The last thing that we are going to talk about is skew symmetric, skew symmetric tensors. I'll be honest with you guys, this is going to appear once and you guys will never see it again in this class. Skew symmetric tensors make our lives a lot harder, as we're going to see. You guys have taken 372 or have taken 372, but how many of you guys have taken 374? Structural design. Anybody? All right, we got a couple. In structural design, whether it's steel, concrete, timber, masonry, aluminum, whatever you guys want, one of the key assumptions we always have is small deformation. All right, we want very small deflections in our structure. Does that make sense? And that makes sense, right? If this is our roof right here, would we want large amount of deflections? No, we'd scare the shit out of you. <laughs> I wouldn't even be here. I'd, I'd be going home right now. But we want small deflections in our structure. And what's that actually, it's an assumption that allows us to simplify everything. As we're going to see, this skew symmetric tensor, when we talk about strain, this is going to be for large deformation, something that we very rarely consider in our structures. Just a little background, but we still need to know what it is. So a skew symmetric tensor is very similar to a symmetric tensor, but instead of it, or the transpose being equal to it, well, it's equal to it multiplied by negative one. Now, because of this property right here, the diagonal components of the skew symmetric tensor must be equal to zero. 
meaning this. The only way this can truly be skew symmetric is if all of these are equal to zero. And if we look at the definition, it's very easy to see that. If I were to have W11, and that has to be equal to negative W11, well, the only way that's possible is if it's zero. So this is going to be a skew symmetric tensor. Now, for every tensor or square tensor, it can actually be decomposed into a symmetric tensor S and a skew symmetric tensor W. That's exactly what we're going to do next lecture with strain. Our total strain in the structure is equal to a symmetric part and a skew symmetric part. Both of them together is the total strain. If I just look at the symmetric part, that's for small deformation. So this is what we're going to use. If we add on the skew symmetric part, that's for large deformation, as, as we're going to see. So M, which is our tensor, is equal to the symmetric part plus the skew symmetric part. How do we calculate them? Well, it's actually simple. The symmetric part is going to be one half of M plus M transpose, and the skew symmetric is going to be one half of M minus M transpose. Almost identical equations, the only difference is one we're adding, the other one we're subtracting. That's it. So if I were to do an example and I were to have my matrix down here, I can decompose it into a symmetric part. So if I were to throw all this into here, I would get this. As we can see, the two off diagonal components are the same. And we can go to the skew symmetric part, zero, zero. And if we were to add these two together, well, we're going to end up back with M. All right, how are you guys doing? I know the theory is boring, especially this early in the morning. So that's it for the theory. So this is again what we covered kind of before, but now we're going to get into some examples because I know that's what you guys want to do. So we're going to start off with invariance. All right. This question is very simple. Quiz number nine. It's just a single question. And all it wants us to do, I'm just going to rotate this. Actually, I'm going to put this down. All right, it's a simple question. It says, find the three invariants of the following matrix. Easy. So who remembers the first invariant? Trace. Trace, exactly. So if I were to go here, we can say that the invariant, or the first invariant of M, this is actually equal to the trace of M. Now, what is the trace of M? Some of the diagonals, very faint, but I still hear it. So whenever you guys hear the first invariant, you guys can take your highlighter, or your pencil, or whatever, and you guys just want to highlight the diagonal components. In this case, one, one, one. The trace of M is simply going to be equal to one plus one plus one, and in this case, it's equal to three. Invariants are actually very simple. That, that was it. Could this be an exam question? Definitely. So 4% of your midterm exam, that's it. And that's why I love this course. The worst enemy when it comes to the midterm is yourself. When you guys get a question that's too easy, that's when the second S starts to appear. And I'm going to make it even worse because under one of the options, I'm going to put none of the above. That'll get every single one of you guys. <laughs> it's mean, but I have to do it. So that's the first invariance. How about the second invariance? You guys don't know what it's called because it doesn't really have a name. Again, I talked about this online, but that second invariance is used a lot in plasticity. So when we start considering things degrading, breaking, cracking, whatever. In this class, we don't consider plasticity. We're only considering elasticity. So we'll never actually use the second invariant, but you'll still need to know how to calculate it. So the second invariant, I2 of M is equal to one half of the first invariant of M squared minus the first invariant of MM. When it comes to the midterm, it's completely open book. So you guys don't really have to memorize this. So you guys can just go over to your notes. So if we were to look at this equation, we basically have two unknowns. We have the first invariant of M and the first invariant of MM. So what's the first thing we're going to need to do before we solve this particular equation? 
we need MM. If we don't know MM, we can't find its first invariance. We can't really do anything. So the first thing that we actually have to do is we have to figure out this component right here, MM. Now what's going to happen is you guys are going to go to Mathematica. You guys already have M defined. You guys just go M dot M. So if we were to go MM, I'm just going to give you guys the answer. But I just want to make sure you guys know that we have to calculate what MM is. So it's going to be 1, 4, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So I'm going to ask you guys, now that you guys have MM, what is going to be the first invariant of MM equal to? Who thinks it's 3? Exactly. You guys are too smart. Three. There's no tricking you guys. At least until I put none of the above. I guarantee you guys are going to fall for it. <laughs> all right. I'm sorry. Back to the I2 of M. So now all we have to do is substitute things. The first thing we had is one half. And then you look back up at the formula. The next thing that we have is invariant one of M squared. Don't forget the squared. That's the second mistake every student makes. We know that the first invariant is equal to 3. So we're going to have 3 squared and then minus the first invariant of m, or the first invariant of mm, which is 3. So this is kind of a funny question because even if students mess up mm and they just use the first invariant of m, uh, it's going to be the same answer, which is kind of nice for you guys. So you guys throw all this in. What do you guys get? Six? Nine minus three, six divided by two? Almost there, guys. That was me in 395. In 395, are you guys taking 395? Do you guys still have that first uh, differential equation review quiz that they had? I remember I had 2 pi multiplied by pi, and I just put it as 4 pi. And I went there, I'm like, what did I get wrong? And I, oh, <laughs> that's what I got wrong. All right, so that's the first two invariants. As we can see, invariants are a piece of cake. How about the third one? What's the third invariant equal to? The determinant, exactly. So the determinant of m. What is the determinants of M? <laughs> it's just equal to one. And it's very simple to see because the only time we can actually make a fish down below, actually, which color should we go? Let's go blue. The only time we can make a fish that intersects two numbers that aren't zero is this fish over here. So we got one multiplied by one minus zero, and then this is going to be multiplied by one. Can't make a fish any other way. Oops. <laughs> it doesn't matter to you guys, though, because you guys are going to throw it into Mathematica. The question you guys always ask, is Mathematica uh, allowed for the midterm? Of course. Of course it is. But as we saw with all those special properties, I don't actually have to give you matrix components. I can ask for things like determinants without even giving you the matrix. So this is where things get a little bit fun. So that's going to be invariance. Should be fairly straightforward. Is there any questions about invariance? All right, everybody's still happy? Perfect. So let's go on to quiz number 10. And I like this one because if you guys want to see what the midterm is going to be like, quiz 10 is formatted in such a way. So the first one says if Q1 and Q2 are reflection matrices. So let's underline that. So these are reflection matrices. And Q3 is a rotation matrix. Which of the following is false? So this is great. Now you guys know why the midterm gets fun. Again, I didn't give you anything for Q1, Q2, except that the rotation, reflection, etc. So let's look at number one. The determinants of Q1 multiplied by Q2 multiplied by Q3 is equal to one. 
what property do we have to use to answer this one or to figure this one out? You guys remember? See, now this is a real head scratcher. The key to this one, which will be to a key to it, at least two in your midterm exam, is the property that if we're taking the determinant of a bunch of matrices multiplied together, well, that's the same as taking the determinant of one, multiplying by the determinant of other, multiplying by the third one. So this determinant of Q1, Q2, Q3, this is actually equal to the determinant of Q1 multiplied by the determinant of Q2 multiplied by the determinant of Q3. That's one of those very special properties that we have. So this is the key here. If you guys don't know this, well, then the rest becomes who knows. The other piece of information we're given is that we have reflection and rotation matrices. Do we know the determinants of those type of matrices? Who thinks yes? Yes, who thinks no? Exactly. And we have to because how else are we supposed to solve it? All right, so it's kind of obvious. Until the midterm exam where I give you guys an option, there's not enough information to solve this question. That's where it gets me. So what is the determinant of a reflection matrix? Who remembers? Negative one. What is the determinant of a rotation matrix? One. So if I were to just substitute these values, this is equal to the determinant of Q1, which is reflection, which we know is negative one, multiplied by the determinant of Q2, which is also reflection, so multiplied by negative one, and then multiplied by the determinant of Q3, which is rotation, so this one's equal to one, what do we get? One, exactly. So is A true? Yes, so we know it's not going to be answer A. What about this one right here, Q, or sorry, B? Q, which is equal to Q1 multiplied by Q2 multiplied by Q3, it's invertible. Is that true? Who thinks yes? All right, who thinks no? No. So you guys think yes, it's true. And this goes back to property four of orthogonal tensors. The product of two orthogonal tensors will also be orthogonal. So it goes back to that property. And if it's orthogonal, we know that it's going to be invertible. So we know that this, that's going to be true. Now, for you big brain students out there, you guys aren't going to even care about A or B. Because if you guys look at C and D in the exam, it says that this is equal to either rotation or reflection. Can it be both? No. So it's kind of a hint right there that it's going to have to be one of these. How do we determine if it's rotation or reflection? The determinants. Did we already calculate the determinants? So if it's equal to positive one, what type of matrix is this? Rotation. So we know it's going to be equal to a rotation matrix. Therefore, is it going to be equal to a reflection matrix? No. So which one is false? Well, we can kind of see right now it's going to be D. How is that? That is a typical midterm type question. You guys can handle that. You guys can handle the midterm. All right, perfect. Any questions about this? No? All right, we'll move on to the second one. So this question's fun. It says let Q and M be what? What does this mean? M3. Three by three matrix. Three by three matrix. It also says let N equal to Q multiplied by M, multiplied by Q transpose, and assume that Q is a coordinate transformation matrix or orthogonal. Which of the following is true? Now, before you begin, what did I tell you guys in today's theory? Whenever you see this definition and we're re relating it to another matrix, what should be popping off in your head? J. 
change of basis. Now, is there very specific properties that two matrices have after a change of basis? Invariance. Whenever you guys see that one matrix C is just another matrix C after a change of basis, you guys want to be thinking about invariance. All right? So it says, which of the following is true? So the eigenvalues of M and N are the same. What do you guys think? True? That's a bit harder. Let's go back to that. One. How about part B? M11 plus M22 plus M33 is equal to N11 plus N22 plus N33. What is this right here? It's a trace. So what this is saying is the trace of M equal to the trace of N? Who thinks yes? Yes, because it is the first invariant. The trace of these two matrices must be the same. So we know that this is true. Now don't be like me. If I was an undergrad, I would say, oh, this is true. I'm good to go. No, because you guys got this little bitch down here. So don't just find a true one and move on. <laughs> Always be careful. That has gotten me so many times in my undergrad. You guys have no idea. So we know that that one's true. What about part C? The determinant of M is equal to the determinant of N. Yes. Is that an invariant? Yeah. Which one? The third one. So we know that this is true. So if you guys get to this point, then you guys can be brave and go with D. Now, A, is that true? Yes. Because what we're doing is we're just changing the basis of M. It's going to retain the same eigenvalues. Think about when we took a matrix M and we diagonalized it. We said that the eigenvalues are going to be the same. The only way we can change the eigenvalues is if we actually were to move our matrix C, not just change its basis. So those are all going to be true. Our answer is going to be D. Any questions concerning this one? If you guys forget about part A, just think of the principal invariants. After we diagonalized our matrix, we said that we have those principal invariants that were all related to the eigenvalues. Eigenvalues do not change after a change of basis. All right. So now we got let Q be a three by three orthogonal matrix. <clears throat> and it says that D is equal to this, E is this, and F is this. So basically this is going to be a vector, this row is going to be a vector, and this row is going to be a vector. Which of the following is going to be true? So the key here is it's gonna test your orthogonal matrix C properties. All right. So which of the following are going to be true? Part A, which is one of the rows dotted with another row is equal to another row dotted with another row, which is equal to another row dotted with another row, is equal to plus or minus one. Who thinks that's true? Oh, I heard false. So what does the dot product mean? Should be zero. You guys have it. So this one for sure, false. I didn't have to explain it, you guys already know. Now, another type of exam thing that I can get to get you guys is I give you guys this right here. Something dotted with something that has been crossed. What is this? This is one of those very fun little properties. This is called the triple scalar product. But for our purposes, it's the same as the determinant. So if you guys don't know that the triple scalar product is also the determinant, we're going to have a little bit of problems. So we have to know that. So what this is saying in B is the determinant is equal to plus or minus 1. Is that going to be true if Q is an orthogonal matrix? What have, we, what have we used Q for? What have we used our Q matrices for? Rotation and reflection. So what is going to be the determinant of Q? Plus or minus 1. So if we come down here, 
you say, oh, okay, it's going to be plus or minus one. Is the determinant going to be equal to zero? No, it's going to be equal to plus or minus one. And both A and B are correct. Well, we said that A is incorrect, so we can cancel that one out. We know it's going to be equal to B. Again, the hardest part of the midterm isn't going to be actually solving things. It's just relating one thing to another. If you guys don't know that this is the determinant, it's going to become kind of tricky. But we know that the determinant of an orthogonal matrix is equal to plus or minus one. It tells us if it's rotation or reflection. So any questions about this particular point? Yes. Uh, sorry, in six floor, I, I'm not thinking. Yeah. 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 It's one of those ones where it could be either way. And that's why we have the plus or minus one. It's going to be orthogonal, but the question is which direction. And that's why we have plus or minus one at the end. Not sure if I'm answering your question. It's a good question. I'll, I'll throw it out. It's better to use a diagram, which I'll do later. All right, moving on to the next one. The figure below sketches the process of a rotation of any vector by 30 degrees in a counterclockwise direction. You guys are experts at this now. What is the rotation matrix Q to apply such a rotation? So for two dimensions, do you guys remember what Q is? Q is equal to a two by two matrix. And you guys have seen so much of this, I guarantee you know it. So what's going to be the first component in the top left? Cosine theta. What about this one over here? It's just going to, we'll worry about the negative later. It's just going to be sine for now. This one's going to be sine. And this one's going to be cosine. So again, we don't have the negative in yet. It says that it's being rotated counterclockwise, right? Counterclockwise. If we were changing the basis, not, not, don't worry about the vector. If we were changing the basis counterclockwise, would the negative be at the top or at the bottom? Who remembers? Who thinks top? Who thinks bottom? Yes. So if we're rotating the basis counterclockwise, our negative would be right there. But are we rotating the basis? No, we're rotating the vector. So what do we have to do? The negative switches to the other side. Because what is this Q right here in terms of the basis? Exactly. This is clockwise for the basis, which is counterclockwise for a shape or a vector inside. I know it's confusing. This is the only thing I've really gotten a lot of questions about. Does that make sense to you guys? Hopefully. All right. I think that this is the last question. I'm not too sure. Consider the orthogonal change of basis from B to B prime. So another change of basis question as shown below. If the components of U in the basis set B are 1, 1, determine the components of U prime and B prime. So it sounds simple, right? We're just working one way. We have U. We can figure out Q. We just want to find U prime. What's missing from this question that you guys are typically given? When we're changing basis, what do we usually say? Do you guys have an angle? No. So how do we figure out Q? This is where it gets fun. We have to use the definition of Q. We'll switch over to pencil. Remember that Q i j is equal to e i prime dotted with e j. Now, if we were to look at this definition, we need E1 prime and E2 prime, which we're given. We need E prime 
or sorry, we need E1 and E2, which we're also given. So if I ever give you guys a question and I give you guys E1 and E2 prime as numbers, this is what we're going to have to go back to, the actual definition of this transformation matrix, okay? If I don't give you guys an angle, don't freak out. See if I give you these values right here. So we'll do a quick example to find one. So let's say I wanted Q11. Well, this is going to be E1 prime dotted with E1. So let's see if I can scroll up to get it just enough. So you guys remember the dot product? Just multiplying components together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the X components of E1 and multiply by the X components of E1 prime. E1 X is one, E1 prime X is 0 0.8. So I know that this is going to be one multiplied by 0 0.8 for the X component. And then I have to add the two Y components. E1 Y is zero and E1 prime Y is negative 0 0.6. But it doesn't matter because we multiplied by zero. Equal to zero, we get this is equal to 0.8. And this is what we're going to do to find Q. If I were to go and dot all the vectors together, I would get that Q is equal to 0 0.8, negative 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and 0 0.8. Just like that. And if I know Q, can I find U prime? Yeah, we know that U prime is simply just going to be Q, which we have above, multiplied by U, which we were given as 1, 1. And we throw that into Mathematica, we get 0 0.2 and 1.4. So how was that? So you guys have seen so many change of basis. This is easy now for you guys. And I think that that's the last question. So are there any questions concerning this quiz? You guys still happy? No, not happy. That's okay. That's university. All right. So the last quiz that we're going to do is going to be concerning symmetric matrices. And these are going to appear on assignment number three. So assignment number three that we're going to be covering today's seminar, as well as on Thursday, is going to be symmetric matrices and strain. Assignment three is going to be due next Friday. And then after that, we're going to have the exam. So symmetric matrices are kind of the last components you guys need for the exam, which are going to be tested this week. So it says considering or consider the following symmetric matrix. We have S as 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, negative 2. Is this symmetric? Yes, because the only off-diagonal components, 1 and 1, they are the exact same. Now it says if the eigenvalues of S, line to 1, line to 2, and line to 3, or sorry, Am I missing something? Oh, it's just defining. Just defining. Them. Okay. <laughs> if the eigenvalues of S are line to one, line to two, line to three, which of the following is true? So this is going to be the key here. And again, this is a very typical exam type question. So the first one is lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three is equal to zero. How would you guys figure that out? What do you guys think? Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, they're equal to 0. Can you guys figure that out immediately? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? So if you guys were to see this question on your midterm, it's not too bad because you guys can throw S into Mathematica, go eigenvalues, and then add them together, right? Yes, but who thinks that's the correct process? No, that takes too long. If you guys are having to do a lot of calculations, it's the first hint that, hey, Clayton screwed me. You guys don't want that. This right here, if I'm adding three components together, what does that remind you of? If I were to go M11 plus M22 plus M33, 
the trace. So remember that for a symmetric matrix, there exists a diagonalized form that's going to be lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, with the rest being equal to 0. And how do we get this? Well, we all we do is change the basis. So we know that the trace of this matrix here must be the same as the trace of this matrix. What is the trace of S prime? This one over here. Lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3, which we have over here. And we know that this must be the same as the trace of this matrix. What's the trace of S? 2 plus 0 plus negative 2, which is 0. So is A true? Yes, it's true. It all goes back to those invariants. That's why the invariants can become so tricky on exams. The second one is lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 are all real numbers. Who thinks that's true? Yes. If we have a symmetric matrix, no matter what it is, it'll always have real eigenvalues. So this one is going to be true. Part C says there is a coordinate system in which S has the form of this diagonal matrix. Well, we know that's true because I just told you guys. So we can say that for this question, it's going to be all of the above. So before this class, you guys haven't, perhaps didn't have the best idea of what the midterm's like. Are you guys starting to get a good idea of what to expect for the midterm? Who is more scared now? Who's less scared? Okay, perfect. Some of you guys are less scared. For those of you that are more scared, there's a lot of this stuff on E-Class to help. Three sample finals, and again, one of them we will solve together to really make sure you guys get the material. It's one of those ones that once you guys know the trick once, well, it's, I can't really modify it. So what has happened in the past is the last, how do I study for this course? Do the sample midterms. It was so, well, actually, I don't want to put this. I can't modify it almost at all. I can't modify the tricks. And it got so bad that when Dr. Samer taught this course, he would have identical questions between two midterms. Because once you guys use the trick, there's no modifying it. So once you guys know all these tricks, you guys are good to go because I can't really change it. I can't change linear algebra, not yet, <laughs> at least. So question number two, so let's consider the following symmetric matrix. We look again, it's only octagonal components are the same. So it is symmetric. It says if the eigenvalues of S are 0, 1, and 2, then the following is an eigenvector of S. This is where the fun begins. I love this question. So we know the eigenvalues of this matrix. How can we use the eigenvalues to find the eigenvectors? Is there any sort of trick? What's my trick? Anyone know the trick? There is no trick. I'm so used to getting you guys to figure out these questions through tricks that you guys always expect a trick. This question is your old friend trial and error. We know that for something to be an eigenvector, it has to have the equation of S multiplied by the eigenvalue, or sorry, eigenvector is equal to lambda multiplied by the eigenvalue. So this one's just trial and error. All you guys have to do is check this equation against the four that I gave you guys. Let's see what I mean. I say we are, all right, we got S multiplied by P which is going to be equal to, and you guys are laughing because I know you guys are just going to put this in Mathematica. Uh, oh, no, this is 1. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is going to be S, which we're given, multiplied by P. So let's assume that we're looking at case A. It says that P is 0, 2, 2. I come over here, I say, okay. I got 0, 2, 2. 
And this, of course, has to be equal to some sort of eigenvalue multiplied by the same eigenvector. So 0, 2, 2. Now, if I were to take S and P and just multiply them together, whether it's in your calculator or Mathematica, actually, I'll try and keep it down so you guys can see. Come on. I was trying to make the bracket neater, but you guys are out of luck. I get 0, 4, 4. So this is going to be that left-hand side, S multiplied by P. And we're saying that this is equal to lambda, which is just some value, multiplied by 0, 2, 2. So asking you guys now, is there a value of lambda that makes this equation true? Yeah, what's lambda? Lambda is equal to 2. If I were to come back up to the top of the question, it says that one of the eigenvalues is 2. Therefore, we know that this is, yes, an eigenvector. I didn't say all of the above or anything like this. So once you find one that's true, you guys are good to go. Let's say you guys stumble upon one that's not true. Let's look at B really quick. If I were to do the multiplication for B, I'm going to get this right here. So S multiplied by P is equal to 0, 3, 3. And this right here has to be equal to lambda times P. So this is equal to lambda multiplied by P. And in case for B, P is 0, 1, 2. It's going to be something like this. Is there a value of lambda that can satisfy that equation? No. So we know in this case, this would not be an eigenvector. All right? So don't always rely on tricks. Sometimes it's just plain old trial and error. But that's why I like this uh, class, at least, because when you guys get to a question like this, if you guys don't know, this is back to question one, if you guys did not know any sort of invariance, anything like that, could you guys just throw this into Mathematica and do it the hard way? Yes, so you guys always have that backup option in this class. What I recommend for the midterm is do all the ones you do know, and then at the end, you guys can start plugging away in Mathematica, trying to get the ones that you don't know. There's always going to be a nice solution in this class. So there's question number two, and now it's this one. Consider the following symmetric matrix, which is just a gong show, which is terrible. Now it says that the eigenvalues of S are three, two, and one, then the third invariant of S is equal to, and before I scroll down, let's just ask you guys, what is the third invariant? The determinant, exactly. So what this is asking for is the determinant of S. And this is how I protect myself from you guys using Mathematica. Can you guys put this in Mathematica? Yes. Is it going to be fun to put in Mathematica? No. So this is where I really want you guys to remember the properties. So the determinant of S, well, we don't really know. But we go back to those principal invariants. Again, that's always the key here. If you guys have something you don't know, look at invariants. The determinant is actually equal to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, all multiplied together. That's it. How do we get this? Well, remember that the form S prime is a diagonal matrix, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So in this one, this is how we know that the determinant is equal to lambda 1 multiplied by lambda 2 multiplied by lambda 3. It's just the determinant of this matrix. So if we know the determinant is equal to lambda 1 multiplied by lambda 2 multiplied by lambda 3, does this question become a piece of cake? Yes, because we know what those three are. Three, two, and one. So all you guys need to do here is go, all right, we got three. We got two. We got one. We know this is going to be equal to six. So we know it's going to be C. How would you guys like it if I had one of the correct answers on the midterm as none of the above. Who's going to hate me? A couple of you guys? 
Uh -oh. <laughs> I, let me just say it's very possible. <laughs> when I created it, I, I did have one of them as none of the above, but I thought that's too mean. And then I'd ask for your feedback and yeah, you guys don't like it. All right, so let Q, S, and S prime be three-dimensional matrices and assume S to be a symmetric matrix and Q to be an orthogonal matrix. If we look here, we have S, we have Q, and then we are also given S prime, which is this. Now S prime here has a very funny form. The diagonals are equal to something and everything else is zero. So if you guys ever have S prime or a matrix that has been transformed into this form right here, what are these values? Eigenvalues, exactly. So if you guys ever have one of these matrices, I didn't tell you guys that these were, I, oh, that's not what I was looking for. All right, how about this one? Oh, that's better. These right here are eigenvalues. And the question says, what is the set of eigenvalues? So what, what's it going to be? A, B, C, or D? Who thinks B? Yes, of course, it's going to be B. So you guys are laughing. You guys are having a great time. Clayton, I know the tricks. This is too easy. What is the eigenvectors? Then you guys aren't happy anymore. So you guys come up and say, okay, well, I got the eigenvalues. What are the eigenvectors? Do you guys know what the eigenvectors are? Or are you guys going to Mathematica? Who thinks they know what they are? All right. In front. What are the eigenvectors? Exactly. If you guys ever transform a matrix into this form, the only way that is possible is if the rows of Q are the eigenvectors. So this first row is an eigenvector. The second row is an eigenvector, and the third row is an eigenvector. So when you guys go to that second part, all you guys are doing is comparing these three rows. That's it. These are all three of the eigenvectors. So 7, negative 3, or negative square root of 3? Well, nope. 8, 0, 0? Nope. Ooh, B, 0, 0, 1. I get a 0, 0, 1 right there. Perfect. Nice and simple. So you guys know all the tricks now. Ooh, this one's fun. Consider the symmetric matrix X, two by two. It wants us to determine a couple things. The eigenvalues, the eigenvectors, and the components of S prime in a coordinate system formed by the eigenvectors of S. Now we're gonna kind of run short on time, so we may not do part B. But I want to show you guys the trick here. So let's start with the eigenvalues of S. So what is the equation? And we're going to do this by hand. I know you guys can go to Mathematica, but again, it's important to know it's here. If I wanted to solve for eigenvalues of a matrix, what do I do? What's my equation that I solve? Exactly. The determinants of the matrix multi, uh, minus lambda i is equal to zero. So we have the determinant. In this case, our matrix is S. So S minus lambda i is equal to zero. So if we were to do this by hand, we say, all right, we're going to take the determinants. And if we scroll up, we have negative 0 0.2 for S11. So negative. 0 0.2 minus lambda. Below that, we have negative 2.4. And then it's symmetric, so this must also be negative 2.4. And then we have 1.2. So 1.2 minus lambda. And of course, the determinant here must equal 0. And all we're going to do is solve this equation. So our first components, negative 0 0.2 minus lambda, we multiply by 1.2 minus lambda. Again, all I did was I 
I'm drawing a fish, right guys? Fish. These two multiplied by each other. And I come up and I multiply these two. So we're gonna go minus negative 2.4 and then negative 2.4 is equal to zero. When we go through this equation, we're going to see that it actually simplifies into a nice quadratic equation being lambda squared minus lambda minus six is equal to zero. And then from there, we can find the two roots. What are going to be the two roots? Who remembers this from what, grade 11? Well, at least grade 11 here in Canada. No one? Has this become too tricky? You guys even remember how to do this? Uh, I'm laughing because I forgot two. I'm just happy to know I'm not the only one. So we can actually simplify this into lambda minus three, lambda plus two is equal to zero. So what are my values for lambda? Three and negative two, exactly. Three and negative two. That's all we have to do to find these eigenvalues. Of course, we're going to go into Mathematica, but as we can see, it's not too difficult to do it by hand if it's two by two. If it's three by three, then it gets a little bit harder. After that, well, that's just mean. I wouldn't do that. So let's say we now know this fun little identity right here. We know that it's three and negative two. Now let's go down to part C. Part C says, determine the components of S prime in a coordinate system formed by the eigenvectors of S. Do we already know what S prime is going to be? Who thinks yes? Exactly. So if I were to go to S prime, so this would be part C, and I'll keep the eigenvalues up. We know that S prime, it says it's going to be Q multiplied by S multiplied by Q transpose. And this is going to be equal to, of course, a two-dimensional matrix. Now, if you guys didn't know any properties, you guys would be throwing that into Mathematica, which wouldn't be fun. It can take you guys a lot of time. But you guys said you guys already know what this is. So what's going to be the first component right here? Who thinks it's three? Who thinks it's negative two? Ooh, <laughs> do you guys know what it is? At this point, it could be either. Exactly. So at this point, we can say three. We know that this one will be negative two. What are going to be the two diagonal components? Zero. Zero. Exactly. So zero and zero. So for part C, you guys can solve it without even having to do part B, finding the eigenvectors. All right. Hopefully, it's not too bad for you guys anymore. Uh, we still got some time left, so we will do part B, I guess, which is the eigenvectors, and the eigenvectors are the ones that no one really likes. So find the eigenvectors. It's very similar to finding eigenvalues. We're just solving an equation. What is the equation? Who remembers what the equation is? If my matrix is S, what is going to be my equation? I solve for eigenvectors. No one knows. <laughs> That's okay. I know it's early, guys. I'm just happy you guys are here. I'll be honest, I didn't attend this class once in undergrad. <laughs> uh, so, no, it's nice to see you guys here. So we got SP is equal to lambda P. Do we know what S is? Do we know what lambda is? Yes, we have two different values now. Those are the eigenvectors. My only unknown is going to be P. So let's consider the first case where lambda is equal to three. What we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, we have an equation here. We know S is simply going to be whatever it is up top, negative two and 1.2. It's negative 0 0.2, 1.2, negative 2.4, negative 2.4.
P1, P2. So quiet when I'm drawing. We know this is going to be equal to 3. And this is going to be P1, P2. So again, if we're solving for these, how many solutions are there going to be when it comes to eigenvectors? Infinite. So what should you guys do once you guys hit this step? Make one of them one. So what I like to do is I say, okay, P1, in this case, is going to be equal to 1. And then I can just go through the first equation. We have negative 0 0.2 times P1 minus 2.4 times P2. But we said P2 is equal to 1. And I know I messed it up. I'm going to put P2 is equal to 1. And then this one is going to be equal to 3 times P1. So 3 times P1. We can solve for P1, and then we have our eigenvector. So in this particular case, if I just scroll down, after we do some fancy math, or sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to put EV. So EV1, we get that this is equal to negative 0 0.6. 0 0.8. So, of course, I assumed something a little bit different. But I, I want to show it to you guys in this form because of something special. If we were to repeat the same process for number two, uh, this is 0 0.8, 0 0.6. So, if I were to make Q, which is my coordinate transformation matrix out of these, it would be negative, oops, P0.8, 0 0.6, 0 .6, negative 0 0.6, and then 0 0.8. Does this form look familiar to you guys? Yes. You got a negative down at the bottom, two of the components are the same. As we can see that this is actually just a rotation matrix. That's it. Then let me go back to your guys' question. If we were to do this, and we wanted this value right here, we would need the eigenvector for 3 first, which would mean that this row would actually be above here. Does that make sense anymore to you guys? I made you guys feel safe. I said you guys can pick either one. But now if we consider this as a rotation matrix, could we have the negative 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and then 0 0.8, 0 0.6 leg? We can. But now it doesn't follow the right hand rule. So the correct answer would be this right here. You want to make it look like a rotation matrix. And this eigenvector is for negative 2. Should be negative 2, 0, 0, 3. Again, they're both technically correct, but the one that we accept as our sign convention would be this. What do I mean by sign convention? Well, you guys remember moments? How our moments are like this. And you guys go to Yong and he has his moments like this. That's all sign convention. In America, they treat moments differently than we do Canada. So if we're going by our sign convention, it'd be this, but they're both technically correct. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. All right, that's it for today. I will see you guys in the seminar today. Thanks, guys.